We had a fascinating one last year. We had last week just the pastor, one of the pastors from Second Holy Trinity. The guys had a lot of questions. It was really interesting. It was interesting. Well, we had a lot of feedback last week. And the guys, they wanted to hear more about different things. So we decided to put an emphasis on that. So that's the first part of the other side of the day. So you're working on all the things. Well, we've done the work a lot so far. We are still working on the work of Jerry Spade. We're not quite sure. Yes, we'd like to get as many around as possible. We're getting some questions about who we might want to have people from the country. We're still working on that. But I'll talk a lot on This next year, the last one year this year, will be very interesting. One of our groups is going to be presenting. Atheist <laughs> well, I'm waiting for that one myself. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, pour forth your Holy Spirit to inspire us with words from Holy Scripture. Stir in our souls the desire to renew our faith and deepen our relationship with your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we might truly believe, believe and live the good news. Open our hearts to hear the gospel and grant us the confidence to proclaim the good news to others. Pour out your Spirit that we might be strengthened to go forth and Witness to the gospel in our everyday lives, through our words and actions. In moments of hesitation, remind us, if not me, then who will proclaim the gospel? If not now, then when will the gospel be proclaimed? If not the truth of the gospel, then what shall we proclaim? And our Father, we pray that through the Holy Spirit, we might hear the call of the new evangelization to deepen our faith grow in confidence to proclaim the gospel, and bodily witness to the saving grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many of you know, you've heard me speak of the late Archbishop Daniel Weekline, who was one of my greatest mentors. I served as his Vicar General for 17 years at the Archdiocese. And every once in a while at a meeting, or even maybe individually if we were meeting, Archbishop B. Klein would simply say, remind me, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And sometimes the result of that question could be, Maybe we don't need to do this anymore, or maybe there's something else we should be doing. But I'll never forget those times when Archbishop Decline said, why are we doing this? I also remember the times, no kidding, when I would say or do something in a meeting and afterwards he would look at me and say, are you nuts? That's <laughs> true, are you nuts? Well, the answer maybe was yes. So why are we here? Why are we doing this? Um, many of you may say, well, I know I'm here. Gosh, I'm on liturgy committee. I'm involved in, in our school or adult education. Um, I work with the scouts. Um, I'm, I'm in PTO. Why, but I serve soup. Why, what does that have to do? I'm in sports. I'm a coach. What's, what's this have to do? Why am I here? The point is, that all of us, no matter what we do, why do we do what we do? It's the work of evangelization. When I worked at the Archdiocese, we learned, this is interesting, one of the most important people or resource people we had at our Catholic cemeteries were the groundskeepers. Because many times people would come to visit the grave of a loved one 
and nobody's around, but the guy was there cutting the grass or pulling the weeds. And they would talk to the groundskeepers and pour out their hearts and just gave them somebody to talk to. So nobody's role can be diminished in terms of evangelization. So that's what this is all about. Now evangelization has been a constant theme of our parish council. It's been a focus for the last two or three years. And of course that's been exacerbated by the pandemic when things have been, in a sense, kind of turned upside down. Many people that were so regular in attendance at Mass and so on, I haven't seen them in three years. I don't, I don't know where they went, um, but the work of evangelization, and what I'm trying to say, has always been present. But I think it's even, uh, even more necessary now, given the challenges that we're facing. And not only because of the pandemic, but I think the recent elections show us we, we as a people are so divided. There's such division. People can and won't even talk to one another. So evangelization in a broad sense is, is very necessary. And so uh, we want to have tonight be kind of a kickoff meeting. Our plan is over time to have three or four more meetings of this kind, but to expand the circle. Okay, you're here because you're leaders in a sense of all kinds of aspects of parish life. That's why you're here. All of us are involved in evangelization. But we want to widen the circle as we as we go on. So what we're going to do tonight, we have invited the resident guru of evangelization, Father Guy Roberts. Uh, many of you know Father Guy. He spoke here a couple of well, before the, everything was before the pandemic. <laughs> we everything is BC, you know. Before COVID, uh, Father Guy spoke in one of our evening of renewals about evangelization, and uh, so he's going to make a presentation. Then we're going to break for some food, and uh, before Father Guy leaves, we'll have a chance to ask him questions, clarifications, make comments, and we'll do the same after after we eat. But the plan is uh, to be out of here by uh, nine o'clock. Oh, daylight savings time has ended. Eight o'clock. We're going to be out of here at eight o'clock. So, so don't worry. Okay, Father Guy is, uh, you know, him probably when he was he was at Joan of Arc uh, for a number of years, and now he's pastor at St. Barnabas on the south side. But and St. Barnabas is the home parish of our dear friend Monsignor Stump. But don't hold that against him. It's a very nice parish. And he's <laughs> his time, Father Guy. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, and uh, Tom of the Evangelization Committee, thank you for inviting me this evening. Great, happy to be with you. I was trying to do the, the math. I think I was, the last time I was actually in residence here at St. Luke, when I transferred back uh, from uh, Archdiocese of Santa Fe, New Mexico, about 17 years ago. So a lot of new faces. I see, see some familiar faces that probably do remember me from back then, but many faces have changed over the years. My own face has changed as well. I used to have a lot darker hair when I was here at uh, St. Luke. I was looking at some pictures a while back um, about that time period. I said, who is that young guy in that picture? And who's the old man in the mirror looking back at me now? But my experience here at St. Luke was very welcoming and it was a very good um, uh, opportunity to come back to this archdiocese and start my work here for the Lord. I took a sabbatical in 2015 because I just wanted to research this thing called new evangelization. And I had thought about not even using that word tonight, but Monsignor already let it out of the bag because as soon as people hear evangelization, they think something like this. Oh, I've got to get up early in the morning and go to the clinic because I have an evangelization scheduled. It's like a procedure. It sounds like something that would be a procedure that's not really pleasant. And if I came up to you and said, I'm going to evangelize you, you'd probably say, please don't. <laughs> So we look at evangelization more in the context of our mission. Every time you go to Mass, well, let me just ask you this. How many of you here tonight are baptized? Raise your hand. You're all evangelists. You're all missionaries. Just because you may not be on the evangelization committee, you can't say, oh, that's what those guys do over there. No. If you're baptized, you are an evangelist. You've been given the Holy Spirit for the purpose of continuing the very work of Jesus Christ. Just, Jesus said, just as the Father has sent me, so I am now sending you. 
And did you ever wonder where the word mass comes from, you know, the Catholic mass? I was asking that question last night. I was teaching RCIA, and I said, no, it has nothing to do with science and the weight of a particular molecule or atomic weight, anything like that. And I said, where do you think the word mass comes from? And for the first time in 25 years of asking that question, one man raised his hand. He says, it refers to the crowds of people, the masses of the people being gathered. And I said, you know, that's a good thought. But that's not really where it comes from. It comes from the Latin misa. At the end of mass, the priest would say something in Latin, ite misa est. To go forth, it is the dismissal. We find that word misa at dismissal, but also M-I-S-S-I-O, missio. You put an N on it, you have mission. So if you were at mass tonight, it wasn't Monsignor who said, okay, you can get on out of here now. It was Jesus Christ himself said, now that you've received my word and you've received my body and blood and you've received the grace of the Holy Spirit, now I am sending you out in my name to make the whole world my church. So the processional of mass coming in is heaven coming down to meet us here on earth, but the recessional is heaven continuing to go out into all the world. How? Through us. And if we don't do the work, who's going to do it? As that opening prayer said, who's going to do this work of Jesus Christ? So evangelization, I wanted to research especially the new evangelization because I'm a convert to the faith. I was training for the Lutherans. I went through Lutheran seminary, actually got the MDiv from the Missouri Synod of Lutherans out in St. Louis at Concordia. And they were training me to be a church planter, which was for them a professional evangelist. And go into a neighborhood where there was no Missouri Synod of Lutheran church and start a community. So back in those days, I did a lot of knocking on doors. That was back in the middle to, you know, really about the middle of 1990s when things were a little different in the world and people would answer their door. And yeah, you'd get a few doors slammed in your face, but by and large, people would still welcome someone knocking at their door. That doesn't work these days. And trying to call people on a landline, most people don't even have a landline anymore. So it's a whole different world. So it has to go beyond just handing out pamphlets and door knocking and thinking about events to get people to come to church. So I wanted to study all the documents of the new evangelization. We call it new evangelization because not that after you know 50 or 100 years, people are going to say, okay, now we need to do something different. That new evangelization is old. New evangelization <clears throat> means you're doing what's current for the times. So new evangelization is never going to get old. It's making Christ relevant today. And as I just said, 25, 30 years ago, we did things a little differently. How do we do evangelization now? That's what new. That's what the new and new evangelization means. So I went and studied all the documents from Vatican II forward, writings of the popes, especially uh, John Paul II, and came up with uh, sort of a formula that can be used in the parish. And because of COVID and because of this and that and my moving parishes, I've never quite successfully gotten this to launch. And part of the reason is you all, as the laity, because you're scared of that word evangelization. <laughs> now, not me, Father. My committee doesn't have anything to do with it. Then it doesn't have any place in the church. If your committee is not evangelization, you have no business doing what you're doing. Go do it in the secular world. It doesn't have to be done here at uh, St. Luke. And that's uh, Archbishop Beekline's question. Why are we doing this? Even if you're on finance council, why do you do what you do? Because... It's all about the altar and what happens at the altar and what happens from the altar in this whole parish. It takes money. So if you're on finance council, yes, it's very essential to the ministry of Jesus. Jesus himself needed funding while he was here on earth doing his ministry. But I want to start with the Great Commission. And as I'm reading this, it's very familiar to you, but that's part of the problem. Anything that's familiar, we kind of block it out. Oh, I've heard that before. Listen with fresh ears to the Great Commission. See, we see that missio in there, the, the, the misa, the commissioning. Jesus approached and said to them, this is the 11 apostles, uh, Judas had, of course, hanged himself. He said to them, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. There's three things I'm going to tease out that have to do with this great commission. Can you think of what those three things are? Jesus says, first of all, all power has been given to me by my Father. And the implication is now I'm giving it to you, the church. So 
Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them, and know that I am with you always until the end of the world. What are the three things that are hidden in the Great Commission? Very first thing, he says. All power and authority given to me. What comes after that? Go. Go out. Isn't that what Mass means? The Misa, the sending forth by Jesus? It doesn't mean you go out in the name of St. Luke Church. If you do that, you're going to fail. If I go out in the name of St. Barnabas Parish on the south side, it's going to fail. We are sent out by Jesus in his name. St. Luke Church exists in his name. So we always have to remember that because parishes can kind of take on a, an identity of themselves, and all parishes are in danger of doing this. That's number one. We're sent by Jesus in his name to go forth. To do what? Baptize. <coughs> okay, baptize and teach. and teach. Those are subsets of number two. Number two, go therefore and make disciples. disciples. So number one is go. Number two is make disciples. How? First little number is baptize them, welcome them to the life of the sacraments. Not just baptism, but to the baptism that admits us to the sacramental life of the church. And by teaching, which includes catechesis, but also proclamation, ongoing Bible studies, ongoing formation. A disciple is never done being a disciple. The disciple can become a master, but always remains a disciple at the same time, always learning. So go make disciples by baptizing and teaching. What's the third thing? A little hard to discern. Jesus says no, K-N-O-W. Have the knowledge that I am with you always. If we're not aware of the Lord's presence within our own lives, within our parish, how in God's name, literally, are we going to share him with others? If we think he's off in heaven somewhere, way out there, all we're going to go in the neighborhood and say, hey, uh, you know, there's, God is up there somewhere. We've got to say, he's here. I saw a bumper sticker many years ago, <clears throat> and it said, God is N-O-W-H-E-R-E. -E. How do you read that? Now here. Now here. Mm -hmm. Most people would say nowhere. No, God is now here. That's what evangelization is saying. Yes, he's at the right hand of the Father, but he also says, I'm with you always. And if we leave that out, his presence among us, I mean, my goodness, Catholics have the real presence right in the tabernacle. We get so busy trying to evangelize that we even make something out of that, that it's not. It's just the Great Commission. It's not about uh, dragging people into church. And this is going back to my Lutheran days. I actually took special seminars and classes and training for being an evangelist for the, for the uh, Lutherans. And of course, their process is a little different. But even they would say, it's not about just dragging people into church. When you get them here, there's got to be a reason for them to be here. They've got to come in the door and say, at last, this is what I was looking for. I'm so happy I'm here now. Because if you just drag them in for an event, if they don't find what they're looking for, don't encounter Jesus Christ, they're just going to go right back out the same door. And it's not about just catechizing them. St. John Paul II said catechesis, and this might surprise you, he said catechesis itself is not evangelization. He says it's one moment within evangelization. It's important, but if I go grab someone off the street and get them by the collar and pin them down and say, now, I'm going to read the catechism to you, have I made a disciple? And they might be able to spout the catechism right back to me. They can be like a parrot and quote it. That doesn't mean it's been in their heart. But catechesis is a part of evangelization, the ongoing teaching that's necessary. Evangelization is not just about the sacraments. How many polls have we seen recently or studies have shown that, what is it, about 35% of Catholics believe that that is Jesus and the, sac the Blessed Sacrament? So they're coming to the sacraments, but are they really experiencing Christ in the sacraments? People can be going through the motions, but they're really not, uh, they're not being open to the grace. It's not finding, they're not assimilating that grace into their lives. So essentially evangelization is about going out, taking what we receive here where God comes to meet us in church, taking that and making his kingdom present everywhere we go. That's the mission of the church, the missio, the going out. And you know what? Its goal is not to increase the number on the rolls of the church. That's a byproduct. It's a good thing to have. 
But ultimately, what's the goal of evangelization, would you say? What is it? Salvation. Salvation. It's eschatological. When you do evangelization, if your mindset is, we need to increase our, our enrollment in the school, or we need to get our numbers up in the pews, or we need to increase our budget, you're going to fail. Evangelization is about getting people to heaven, bringing them to the eschaton, the, the fullness of life with the Father and the Son and the angels and saints in heaven. During this month of all souls, we're praying for our loved ones and that great reunion, that great homecoming. So evangelization, is first, of, first and foremost, is about eschatological reasons, getting people to salvation, bringing them to heaven. So that's just kind of to set the stage for uh, getting the right mindset. And when you think about it that way, you can use the word mission instead of evangelization. When I was Lutheran, it, at the time I was going through uh, my undergraduate in college, I was living, I was going to Butler and studying uh, there, and I was doing my, um, I was living at home, so I could still serve my home parish. And uh, at a very young age, I became the director of missions and evangelization for the Lutheran, my Lutheran church. So if evangelization scares you, just think about mission. It's Jesus sending you forth in his name. That's not so scary, is it? He says, I'm with you. He doesn't just say, I'm going to sit here and watch you go out there and fail. Believe me, when I knocked on doors and did cold calls for the Lutherans, do you know what the return rate on, if you knock on 100 doors, you know how many responses you're going to get that are positive? Two or three. And you're going to get a lot of people that curse you out for, for knocking on their door, and you're going to get some people that just are indifferent. And it takes a lot of courage to go up and knock on a door that's too much you, you don't know. So I'm, I'm glad those days are behind me, because it was going to scare you. Even though I did it a lot, it's still not an easy thing to do. So Jesus still doesn't sit back, and I always had to remind myself, no, you're with me, Jesus. When I knock on this door, if it's just Guy Roberts going up to the door, I'm going to fail. I'm just a traveling salesman. But if I go in his name and with his presence, and I allow him to speak through me, then even if the person's not receptive, maybe I planted a seed. Maybe it's going to bear fruit one day, and I won't even know it. So we simply go forth in his name, not worrying about the outcome. Let's let Jesus worry about the outcome. We're just called to go and share the good news. Now, looking at St. Luke here, I have to ask you a strange question because as a Lutheran, when people would ask me, what is evangelization? I'd say it's marketing. <laughs> to take a, you know, from the business world, it's marketing for Christ. And a lot of the same tactics. I mean, why is it the same? Because you're dealing with human beings, aren't you? It's not so much what the product is, it's the people you're trying to, to, to deal with. And in the business world, you're trying to get them to become clients or to buy something from you. But it's the still same human conditions, same human psychology, same human needs. And we're not even trying to get them to buy something. We're trying to give them something. So what is, you know, if we're going to be good at marketing, what if, uh, if Coca-Cola hired you to be a marketing executive and you said, what is it again we're supposed to be selling? Is it donuts? What is it? It'd be gone. You gotta know what your product is. So, at St. Luke, as a member of the Universal Catholic Church, sent by Jesus Christ, what is our product? What are we offering to people? Let's think about this for a minute. Churches, especially um, the bigger churches like St. Luke and now St. Barnabas, have a lot of different programs, things that people can come to. Um, things of interest for lots of different types of people, young, old, middle-aged, so forth, is St. Luke marketing its programs? Is St. Luke marketing a community? Come and join us. We're a friendly parish. You find fellowship here. Certainly people might be coming for different programs. They might be coming because they're lonely. They need that sense of community. They want it for their children, for their family. Maybe it's the school. Are you marketing the school? Is that your product? Is it maybe good Catholic values in a world where values are going down the toilet faster than I could ever imagine they would? I'm 55 years old. I never imagined in my time, my lifetime, that I'd be seeing some of the things that are very prominent now. I thought, oh, that's going to happen 200 years in the future. And I've seen even in the last 15 years really spiraling downward. So is it that we're marketing, come and find good truth, come and find value, morality, um, Christian values? None of those things. If that's your starting point. Oh, come to St. Luke because we have a good school. Could a Jewish kid come here? I don't know if you have a lot of Jewish students in the school or not, but I mean, it's kind of, what I'm saying is 
they don't even have, they can be an atheist. They can come to, to, to St. Louis School and be a, be a patron, but not necessarily here for the right reason. So what is it that we're offering? What is our product? Anybody have any thoughts? Jesus. Ah, God bless you. Who said that? Okay. You get an A. You get a gold star tonight. Because when we forget that, and we go out and we try to market our parishes and say, oh, you should come to our parish because we have this going on, and we have that, and we have a winning football team, and we have all these things going on, you're going to fail. All those things are wonderful if they are the outgrowth of why people will come here and what we're trying to offer them. It's not anything, it's a someone. It's Jesus Christ. You know, we have this word evangelization that scares people and confuses people. There's another word that's <clears throat> confusing for a lot of people that also starts with an E that's very prominent in the Catholic Church. The Eucharist. I've been Catholic since 1996, and I was so excited about receiving the Eucharist. And when I, when I got immersed in Catholic parishes and the people who have been cradled Catholics, they could talk about this thing called the Eucharist and never make the connection that that's Jesus Christ. It's this other thing that the priest holds up and you go up and receive it. And you know, So it's, it's very important for us to recognize even people's perception of the Eucharist, they might be missing Jesus Christ because it's this object that they don't understand. So we have to realize it's got to be the person of Jesus Christ that's bringing people here that we are announcing to the world because he is the word made flesh. And that's the thing. Our message cannot just be a disconnected message of God loves you. God bless you. St. Luke Parish loves you. We would really like to have you come here. Uh, this good news is preached here. You ask, what is the good news? Because evangelization, oiangelion in the Greek, where evangelization comes from, it means literally the good news. What is the good news? It's not a what. Who is the good news? That's very important if you're going to do evangelization. It's about the who. Anytime you find yourself thinking about Jesus as a what, or marketing <coughs> the things instead of the person, then you will fail. And you might get some success with getting people to come here, but they're not going to be here for the right reasons. They're going to plug into all these different things, and you know what they're going to do? They're going to start causing trouble because they're never going to be satisfied. And you're going to have rumblings, and nothing will ever be good enough. But you know what? If they encounter Jesus Christ here, they're going to say, that's what my soul was listening and looking for. Um, St. Augustine, of course, uh, uh, running away from the Catholic faith, he was trying to find a faith that would fit his own lifestyle. He was uh, into Manichaeism, a form of Gnosticism. And he could pretty much do whatever he wanted with his body because they said the body is trash. The body doesn't count for anything. As long as your mind is lifted up to the mysteries of God, whatever that might be in the Manichaean world, then you can be saved because you're going to discard your body anyway. So you can go and get involved in all kinds of uh, hedonistic things and still be a good uh, a good person of God. And he thought that would make him happy, and he found out over a little while it didn't. After many years, it didn't. And finally, when he allowed Christ to enter his heart, he kind of had a breakdown, emotional catharsis, and he said, why did I wait so long? How long I waited to let you love me, to love you in return? How late have I loved you, he said. So, but he still accepted Christ. He said, you were there all along. You were calling out to me. I was covering my ears. I didn't want to hear. I was deaf. So you were flashing your light at me, and I didn't want to see it. He said, you were pursuing me all the time. And finally, I allowed you to find me. So that finding of the person of Jesus Christ. If people find Jesus Christ here at St. Luke, in the flesh, in person, they will come, and they will feel safe, and they will feel loved, and they will feel cared for, by the Good Shepherd as one of his flock. And they should not just come here and find Jesus Christ in the flesh, which is his Eucharistic body. Where else should he be in flesh? All the baptized. Oftentimes when I do anointings of the sick, especially those who are very ill and near, near death, I'll tell them thank you. And I anoint them and I say, you know, this anointing is to assure you that because of your baptism, you have become the body of Christ. And when you suffer, you're making his suffering a present reality. The cross is not left way back there somewhere. We don't have to point to it. In the body, which is the mystical body of the church, the suffering and in faith makes the cross a present reality. And I say, you're sharing in the redemption of the world. 
because your suffering is the suffering of Jesus. We are his body. We are his flesh. That's the mystery of the Eucharist. Bread and wine come up to the altar along with what normally on Sundays? What else do we bring up? I'm assuming you do it at Barnett here at St. Luke. We pass the baskets here. Yeah. Bring the offering, or offering up. The money that's collected is a symbol of ourselves. Offering back to God what we have first received from him. And, and especially the bread and the wine is also a part of that offering. It's the first fruits we're offering back in the form of bread and wine. And what happens to that bread and wine? It goes on the altar. And what does it become? The body of Christ. The blood of Christ. And if that symbolizes us, that's what we are. We are his, his body. So we have to make Jesus present to the world in the flesh and share him as human persons. God's Son came into the world not as an angel, nor as some weird entity that hung down from the sky like 50 feet up in the air and said, let me tell you about this distant God who loves you. No, he came all the way down as one of us. Today is the feast of Pope St. Leo the Great, known for his teaching on the incarnation of Jesus Christ, for the, the defense of Jesus' true um, humanity, fully human, fully divine. And so we have to be that human person of Jesus today, witnessing in a personal way. If I come up to you and say, here, here's a pamphlet, let me tell you about Jesus. It's not going to make such a big deal. Here's a pamphlet about Jesus, you can read about him. But what if I am Jesus for you? And what if people that are in your presence say, you know, there's something different about you than most people. You know, when I'm with you, I feel calm, I feel loved, I feel like I'm in the presence of God, I feel like I know Jesus. That's when you know you have succeeded as an evangelist. We have to be that face, of, that human face of Jesus to others. So a part of the new evangelization's teaching is like ministers to like. School teachers, we've got a lot of school teachers here. School teachers witness best to other school teachers. Parents of younger children witness better to parents of younger children. Priests witness to priests. Doesn't mean that's this exclusive. Neighbors witness to neighbors differently. Family to family. So basically it means wherever you have those most intimate connections, that's where you're going to be most effective because people who know you are more apt to respect the message. If a stranger comes up and says, let me tell you about Jesus, you might be shy of that. But if someone comes to you in a moment of trouble or turmoil or death of a loved one, it says Jesus is there for you and I'm here for you. That's evangelization. Jesus always calls persons by name. I was uh, serving in eastern New Mexico, northeast New Mexico, for a number of years, and we had a lot of the Texas people that would come across the border, and a lot of the accent was similar. I like to say, you know, Jesus doesn't just come to us and say, hey, y'all, hey, y'all want to go to heaven with me? He comes to each one by name. He says, Joe, Teresa, Mary, Donald, this is for you. Let's look at some scriptures where he does that. Um, particular one that um, reading we had rather recently. And that's the story of Zacchaeus. I'm keep an eye on the time here. If you recall, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. The tax collectors weren't really well loved in Israel at the time because they weren't collecting taxes for Israel or for the temple. They were collecting taxes on behalf of the Roman government, this occupying force. And so the tax collectors who were Jewish were considered to be turncoats by their other Jewish brothers and sisters. They made a good living, but it came at the cost of a lot of friends and a lot of respect. So most of the time in the scriptures, the tax collectors had to be friends with other tax collectors, ah, like ministering to like, or you know, other sinners as they call them. So Zacchaeus has heard about this man named Jesus, and he heard that Jesus is going to be passing through this town of Jericho. And you can imagine a parade, people lining the streets both sides as Jesus and his disciples are passing through. And people are following him, trying to get a look at him, maybe to touch him. And Zacchaeus is kind of a short man. He can't see over the crowd. So he gets an idea. He says, I know down the road there's this tree with a branch that sticks out over the road. I'm just going to go climb that and I'll sit there. And you imagine his feet dangling like a kid uh, sitting from this branch. And so he's getting a good look at Jesus coming down the road toward him. And he looks down, Jesus is under the tree, and to his amazement, and to everyone in the crowd's amazement, Jesus stops and looks up at him. Now, these men had never met before. But Jesus calls him by name, Zacchaeus. 
And when I talk about the name that, you know, we've been given a birth name, a name that we go by, but every person that God has ever created from the time of, of the first Adam and Eve until the last person will be born, every person has a unique name that's never repeated. We have a lot of, in the Catholic Church, we have a lot of Joes and Marys, don't we? <laughs> Mary Ann's and so forth. But there's a name that you've been given by God that's not repeatable. No other person will ever have that same name. And it's not a name that you can speak with your lips. It's not a name you can write on a piece of paper. But when Jesus speaks that name to your heart, you wake up. Because you know that name. And nobody else but Jesus can speak that name. Because only he knows it and only you know it when you hear it. But in this case, he speaks through the, the given name of Zacchaeus. And he speaks more than just his ears. He speaks to his heart. So he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. Can I stay at your house today? Zacchaeus is amazed. He's, wow, this is pretty awesome. How does Jesus know me? I mean, of course you can come to my house. I'm very honored. And the people in the crowd are grumbling. Why is he going to go stay at that guy's house? Doesn't he know that's a sinner and a tax collector and he hangs around with a bunch of hooligans? So they have the dinner and Zacchaeus makes an announcement. Welcomes Jesus into his home. Makes an announcement. He said, Lord, haven't been doing very well in life. From now on, I'm going to change. Half of everything I make is going to go to the poor. And anybody that I cheated, I'm going to pay them back four times as much as I took from them. And what does Jesus say if you know that story? He says, today salvation has come to this household because this man too is a son of Abraham. He belongs to God's covenant people. You're going to meet some Zacchaeuses in church work. You probably know some Zacchaeuses right now. A Zacchaeus is someone who's not involved in the church. They're not opposed to the church. They're interested. But they just don't see how it's for them. They think, no, I'm, you know, I'm not good enough to go to church. Um, I want to just get a peek at Jesus, and I would like Jesus to love me, but I know this just isn't for me. All they need is that little nudge. They're already looking in the door. They just need an invitation. Or maybe they need you to ask them for something. Jesus didn't just come kick the door in and say, Hey, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come into your house. He said, Can I come to your house today? He allowed Zacchaeus to be in a position of power over him where he got to host Jesus. So you're going to meet some Zacchaeuses out there, people that are curious and they might be buying books about the faith and maybe they've attended some masses or maybe they've been away from the church a long time. Maybe they've had a bad marriage and they feel like they're no longer welcome at church. They just need that little nudge. So the Zacchaeuses are pretty easy to evangelize. They just need that little something to push them over the edge, bring them in the threshold, and then they're happy to be back. The woman at the well in John's Gospel, John chapter 4. Yeah, interestingly, we never know what her name is. It's never mentioned in the text. But Jesus knew what her name was. And he touched her in her heart by that name. I'm going to set that set up that story for you. Jesus... Um, passing through Samaria, and the Samaritans, of course, in northern Israel, didn't like the Jews, and the Jews didn't like the Samari Samarians. The Samaritans, rather. Um, Samaritans were kind of a sect of Judaism that worshipped in a different place, and they sort of had, they were kind of a spin-off. So, kind of like a Protestant denomination compared to the Catholic Church, if you want to think about that. Anyway, they didn't get along well together, and that's why Jesus told the parable once of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, who was hated by the Jewish people, was the only one who helped the guy out of the ditch and took care of him when the priest and the Levite failed to do so. So anyway, he's uh, passing through some, uh, some, the, the Samaritan town, and it's about noon, so it's, the, it's a hot part of the day, and every town would have had a public well, and Jesus is sitting there, and the disciples are going to go on into the town to buy some food. And while he's there, this woman comes stumbling out to draw water. If you were a classy woman, a righteous woman in those days, let me just ask you this. To get a household awakened in the morning, does that take a lot of water? You've got toilets to flush, people to wash, food to make. It takes a lot of water. So first thing in the morning, while it was still dark, the women of the town would have gone to the well to draw the water that they needed to wake up the day. It's noon. This woman comes stumbling to the well. She's probably hung over. She probably threw on something she was wearing the night before. She's not in the best of mood. 
and she's going to draw water. She doesn't want anybody to look at her, and she's thinking, great. Here's this Jewish guy just hanging out by the well. I hope he doesn't say anything to me. But he does. He says, would you give me a drink? And this just really ticks her off, doesn't it? Notice how Jesus asks, Zacchaeus, can I come to your house? And he asks her, will you give me something? Will you give me a drink? I'm kind of thirsty. She's ticked off. She says, you or Jew are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Because in that culture, even today in the Middle East, a strange man really doesn't speak to a strange woman. And not only that, but he's a Jew, she's a Samaritan. So she's really upset about this, and she says, I'm not going to give you a drink. She says, you don't even have a bucket to draw with. Look at you, you're kind of foolish, aren't you? How are you going to get some water? And Jesus said, you know, it's too bad you won't give me a drink, because if you ask me, I could give you a drink. And it would be living water. In that culture, living water meant bubbling water, flowing water, refreshing, cool water. Something we take for granted in our culture today. She was going to drop her bucket down in this well, and that was fresh water, but it was, you know, it's well water. Probably didn't, maybe whatever metals were in it, probably didn't have the best of taste. And so she's thinking about this flowing, bubbling water. And she says, that would be kind of cool. And he said, you know what, if you drank of it, you would never get thirsty again. And it would become in you a wellspring, and you would be able to feed this, give this to drink of, of anybody you wanted to. And she says, you know, you're kind of talking like you're some kind of a mystic or a holy man. And she starts talking about the Messiah. She says, you know, my people also believe the Messiah is going to come one day. And, um, and uh, Jesus says, you know, the Messiah is going to come. And then he said, if you uh, want to meet him, go call your husband. I'm, I'm the Messiah. And she said, well, you know, I really don't have a husband. I'm not married. And Jesus says, I know you're not married. You've been married five times already. And the man you're with now is not your husband. You're just shacking up with him. He doesn't condemn her for it. He just calls her out on it. But you know what? It opens her for grace. It's not a con- condemnation. Before she can really come to the Messiah and acknowledge him as her Savior, she's got to acknowledge her sins. So what does she do? This woman who was a few minutes ago stumbling to the well and making fun of Jesus, now she's interested. She wants this living water. Do you think she's already starting to have it bubbling up in her? Because if you know the rest of the story, what does she do? She goes back into the town, and she says, Hey, everybody. Now, she's not very well liked. She's that woman that they all talk about. She goes in, the least likely evangelist, and she says, Hey, everybody, I found the Messiah. And they all say, Well, maybe she did. They go out, and they... Jesus spends a couple days there. And after he's there for a couple days, by the time he leaves, they go back to the woman, the townspeople, and they said, you know what? At first we believed because of your testimony. Now we believe for ourselves. She brought them to Christ in a very unexpected way. You're going to meet some women at the well in your work in the church. And it doesn't always have to be a woman at the well. It's going to be a lot of men who are at the well also. Um, and these are the people who really don't believe that God loves them at all. They're not looking for religion. They're just kind of stuck in a rut. They're kind of hopeless. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I feel lousy all the time. I don't like it, but I don't know any other way. And you can be the one to show them a new way, to give them hope, to introduce them to Jesus, to make them awaken in their souls to become living water so that they too can give that living water to others. So there's people that are just out there just waiting for that, that someone to be that Christ for them to say, um, this is for you too. You're not a lost soul. No one is lost. Third story I want to tell. Someone you might not have thought of as an evangelist. Mary Magdalene. Actually, we call her the Apostle to the Apostles. Mary Magdalene was a longtime follower of Jesus. Uh, loved the Lord very much. One of his very faithful disciples. Stood there with Mary, the mother of Jesus, at the cross. John, the apostle, finally came back. We think John must have been the youngest. He was probably an idealistic teenager because he lived up until the end of the first century. The others had already been martyred. John was the only one not to be martyred, but he was also given custody of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, So his, his life ended naturally rather than in martyrdom. But Mary Magdalene was one who stood there at the foot of the cross. She said, I don't care what happens to me. That's my Lord on the cross. I love him. I'll die with him if I have to. But what happened on that first Easter morning? 
She went while it was still dark. She had to wait for the Sabbath. Her heart must have been breaking. She wasn't allowed to work on the Sabbath. All she wanted to do is to get to that tomb and prepare the body properly because it had been hastily wrapped up and not really prepared with any spices or it hadn't even been washed. And so she spent that whole Sabbath morning thinking about the poor body of Jesus that she was going to take care of and to show dignity to. So she went there early in the morning, preparing to pray over his corpse, and it's gone. Now her heart is really breaking because to add insult to injury, can you imagine if someone stole your dead loved one, went to the grave to visit him a couple days later, and the grave's open and the body's gone? I mean, that is just a a kicker. So Mary Magdalene is weeping, and she goes to tell the apostles. She, she She has two Easter messages. The first one is gloom and doom. She wakes him up and she says, I went to the tomb this morning, and guess what? Somebody stole the body. It's gone. So the first message of Mary Magdalene was gloom and doom. Do Catholics sometimes have a gloomy, doomy message? I noticed that when I became Catholic. I was so excited about being Catholic, and I was meeting a lot of Catholic clients. What are you so excited about, young man? And, um, oh, I've got to get ready to go to church now, or constantly walking around, oh, such a sinner, and I've got to do this, and I've got to make the stations of the cross, I've got to fast on Fridays and do all these things. Do you think that's attractive to anybody? <laughs> hey, come be a Catholic and you can be like me. That was Mary Magdalene. She's a faithful disciple, wasn't she? But she had a message that was not going to attract anybody. She went back later in the day. She's crying at the tomb. Jesus is behind her talking to her. She thinks he's the gardener. Jesus, her Jesus is a corpse and he's missing. And woman, why are you weeping? That's a question we all have to answer. Why are you weeping? If you're my disciple, why are you going around gloomy? Why are you being so heavy? Have I not risen for you? That's why we're gloomy, because we haven't experienced the risen Christ. So then finally she says, well, I'm gloomy because they've stolen the body of my Lord. And he's finally, he says, Mary. Again, he calls her by her name. And it's not just the name she hears with her ears. It's that secret name in her heart, Mary. She wakes up and she looks around. It's the Lord. She calls him Rabbi. She grabs onto his feet. Don't cling to me. She's thinking to herself, he's not getting away from me ever again. (laughs) Not going to go through this again. Things are going to get better now. It's going to be like it always was. I've got him back. Jesus doesn't want us to be like it always was because Jesus, from the time he came into this world, was on a pilgrimage back to the Father. I'm going to my Father, he says to her, and your Father, to my God and your God. Because I've died and risen, now everything that is mine is completely yours. You have every right to call him as much your father as he is my father and my God. So what does he say to Mary Magdalene? Don't cling to me instead. What does he say? Do you remember? Go and tell. Do you think those are two things? I love those trick questions. It's one thing. Yeah, going and telling for Mary Magdalene, because she had ris- witnessed the risen Christ, everywhere she went, whether she opened her mouth or not, her life was saying, he's alive. She was radiating with that message without uttering a word. She did utter words, it doesn't exclude that, but going and telling or not, I have to go over there and I'm going to tell somebody. Now, everywhere I go, I'm telling the message. I am the message. Christ is risen in me, and I can't, I can't keep him hidden. It's so wonderful. I radiate with that joy and that presence of the Lord. That's a true evangelist. So everywhere that Mary Magdalene went, she was telling the story without even using her lips. But she did go to the apostles, and what happened? She said, he's alive. That was her second Easter message. He's alive. I've seen him. And they're like, Pfft. They didn't believe. Not until that evening when Jesus appeared in the upper room. Then he um, scolded them for their lack of belief. So I sent you an apostle today, and you didn't believe her. So the very first um, evangelist on that, on that occasion was Mary Magdalene. So what did we learn from all this? I've got to start to wrap this up quickly. Um, teachers. How many of you are school teachers? If you go into class and you just say, open your books to page 64 and we're going to start learning this lesson, that doesn't work very well. First of all, you have to introduce new material with a hook. It's something that's going to grab their attention. Oh, this is kind of flashy. This might be kind of fun. 
never seen this before and then the second thing is it has to be relevant to their life if you want them to remember it to really learn it it's got to be applicable to real life got to be a correlation between just this book and what I can do with it it's about me and this is good for me and then once they learn it's good for them are they going to learn it they'll invest in it won't they they'll be formed by it and after they learn something new are children excited to tell somebody about it your little first grader or kindergartner whenever they teach that now might come home from school mommy daddy did you know that one and one are two two and two is four and just, oh really tell me about that of course you know it but for them it's brand new it's something exciting and they can't help but share it same thing happens that's just the way human beings work same thing happens with evangelization the four points I'm going to give to you think about a circle at the top of the circle is number one the encounter with Jesus Christ not only the people we're trying to evangelize but we as the evangelizers we all have to have a daily encounter with Jesus Christ Maybe many times throughout the day, that's wonderful, but at least once a day, we have to be somewhere where we encounter Jesus Christ, because that's the hook. It gets our interest. We might have known Jesus all of our lives, but today we have to have that, that jolt that we need. You drink your coffee in the morning to get the caffeine jolt, and you need your Jesus every day too, something that's going to bring you to an encounter with him. And then the second thing is we're on the top of the encounter, we go around the side of the circle. Number two is the personal call. Again, Jesus doesn't just say y'all. He says, Tom, I love you. I died on the cross for you. And I want you to live with me forever. What do you say? And that's kind of dangerous when we tell someone we love them, isn't it? Because we're putting ourselves out there. We can be rejected. Jesus is asking something from us, just as he did from Zacchaeus, from the woman at the well. But what he asks is, Yes, Jesus. Because really what he's asking is, will you marry me? He's the groom. We're the bride. Pretty embarrassing when a man goes to a woman and says, Honey, I love you. Will you marry me? She says, Ah, let me think about it. Can I get you back with you tomorrow? Or, no, nah, I'm really not interested. So Jesus asks us something. He puts himself out there, makes himself vulnerable. He's kind of craning his ear to listen for us to say, Oh, yes, I love you too. You mean this is for me? We did this for little old me? Not just for the whole world, but for me as an individual? Boy, that's pretty important, isn't it? Now we've fallen in love with him. We've said yes to Jesus. It's not just an encounter. Does Zacchaeus say yes to Jesus? Yes, you can come. Can I come to your house? Well, absolutely. When you say yes to it, then you realize it's for me, it's relevant, it's worth my time. What happens as a result of that? Formation. Ongoing formation. We're at the bottom of the circle. Number three, ongoing formation, which leads to total transformation. We're never going to get there in this life. Formation, formation, formation. Only through a whole lifetime are we completely transformed into the image of Christ and become a saint. So only once we've had the encounter with Jesus and we've said yes to it, it's worth my time, I'm investing in it, I want it, only then are we going to be transformed by it. And that leads us around to the other side of the circle, number four. We could call it mission, but I prefer to call it being sent by Jesus in his name. Because sometimes we get excited, we're going to do a mission. Okay, what's our mission going to be? No, no, it's being sent by Jesus, who already tells us what our mission is. If we get that wrong, we're going to go off the rails. And guess what happens when we do mission? The circle goes back to number one again. We become an encounter with Jesus. And I don't, I don't, my senior can tell you this, and uh, anybody who ministers to the sick, Father Jairosh, you go in, you're ministering to someone who's dying. How many times have you been witnessed to by that person? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just us doing the evangelizing. It's Je Jesus is the evangelist. He evangelizes to the evangelizer as well as to those who are hearing the good news. So Jesus is the evangelist that the Father sent into the world. We're just doing the work in his name, opening ourselves to be evangelized as we do evangelization itself. So only after being sent has it become a personal testimony. We've gone through the stages, encounter, saying yes, being formed, and now it's ours to tell, like Mary Magdalene. Our going forth is our telling the story because it's the story of our life, because it's the story of Jesus in us. It's our personal testimony of Jesus in my life. I'm going to share one little short story with you, and then we'll kind of wrap up here. 1976, my dad and my little brother and I were in a very bad accident in a pickup truck. We were hit by a train. 
I wasn't too far from home. And one of the neighbors that knew who we were, he got in his car and he went to get my mom and he brought her to the accident scene. And she didn't know if we were dead or were going to die, what was going on. And they were putting me into one ambulance to take me away. And my little brother was, they were putting like this neck brace on him and he was kind of out of his mind. He was thrashing. And my mother was telling him, it's okay, Jesus is with you. A paramedic overheard that. It was working on my brother. And about, I think it must have been six months, maybe a year, I guess probably a year later. It's been so long I can't remember. About a year later, I was at home. My little brother was at home. Some man knocked at the door. Mom answered. And he said, ma'am, you don't know who I am. He said, but that day when your little boy, you didn't know if he was going to live or die, you were telling him that Jesus was with him. And he said, I needed to hear that. He said, because my life was a mess. And I was not in a good marriage. Things were going south with my wife. I was drinking. I was getting in trouble. He said, when I heard you say that to your little boy, I started going to church again. And he was a Protestant. He said, I'm in the process of becoming a deacon in my church. We never know how we're going to evangelize. My mother was not trying to evangelize that day, but she did. So we should never pre-plan all this and say, okay, tonight I'm going to go out and evangelize this person. It's going to be, here's my script, and it's going to be like this, and they're going to respond that way. Never know how the Lord is going to work. We have to be open to the Holy Spirit. It's not our work. It's first and foremost His work that's being done through us. And it won't happen apart from us. It's God's action through our activity. We can say it that way. So my final uh, point to make tonight is, how can we be deliberate and intentional about testifying to Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ? How can we be deliberate and intentional about making him present, making St. Luke a place where people can find him? And I'll leave you with these two final thoughts. Can people find Jesus here? How? So, I was scheduled to stay with you, but um, I'm going to go ahead and, and duck out a little bit early. But do, you, do we have time? Do you have a couple quick questions for me before I, I, I take off? What you have at your table is a visioning process that I'm going through at St. Barnabas right now. It's just for your, you know, it's not something you have to labor at. It's just what we're doing at Barnabas. Our visioning process is based on these principles of the new evangelization. So I wanted to share with you all so we can see what we're doing down there. Because this is a way for every ministry to really become involved in this and to be guided through it. To ask yourself the tough questions. Are we evangelists or not? Are we, as Monsignor was talking about, um, Bishop, Archbishop Beekline, is what we're doing relevant today? Or was, has it lived its, has it run its course? What do we need to be doing new? What's the Lord putting under our nose right now? And, and you know, I think the Lord Jesus gets here, tired of hearing churches say, but we've always done that. Well, it's new evangelization, meaning look, open your eyes and look and see what's right at your doorstep today and what opportunities you might be missing for evangelizing today to this community. So, it's been a pleasure to be with you here this evening. Tom, thank you for inviting me. Who else was on the evangelization committee? Um, okay, that's just right. Okay, very good. Well, God bless you all in the work that you do. It's all, even though it's an evangelization committee, they're there to kind of shepherd and guide you in the process. You're all evangelists and the work of this whole parish and the school is very, very important. So let me give you a final blessing. May the blessing of Almighty God who sent his Son to reveal his love to the world and whose Son now sends each one of us to continue his mission until the end of time bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Father God. Do you uh, have any questions before Father Corey has to take off? Yes. I just have a quick one. I, I just feel like addressing the people that are younger, like maybe 30s, where they kind of feel like God's everywhere and I don't need, that's where I just feel like we're, we need to help. Yeah, I think, I think that's the largest denomination in the country right now, the nuns, N O N E S. Yeah, the very person, it's, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And that works for a while. We need to find.
find them in their pain. And uh, sometimes, you know, Jesus knows how to reach in and touch that nerve. But also, if they see us living it and it's relevant, they really are yearning for that personal. That's why God sent his son in, in human form as a human person. So we try to awaken them. That <clears throat> many of them don't think that's possible. I think we're living in that post-Christian era where they've been so deluded or disillusioned with the church over the years. Now they're just shy of it. And I think what we have to do is don't crucify me for this. But I often tell people, especially because I'm a convert, I'll tell people, you know what? First and foremost, I'm not a Catholic. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yes. And it's lived out through the Catholic Church. But if you start with, I'm going to make you a Catholic, you can be Catholic and never know the Lord of the Church. So we've got to introduce them to the Lord of the Church. And then they'll want to find him here where he is available. Anybody else? Okay, I think we're going to break in just a minute. One of the things Father Guy said is very true. Many people may come to, uh, well, St. Luke, for example, for more or less the wrong reason. And I, I could probably use the school as an example. Uh, people that are Catholic, even non-Catholic, non they may be coming here because of the good academics, the good discipline, they feel safe, whatever. And sometimes I say, I don't care, but they're here. And once they're here, we can spread our mission. We can introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ and take off from there as long as they're here. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a lot to it, and a lot to unpack. So I think uh, Father Giroir spent the whole afternoon making these pizzas. <laughs> so we'll see how we like Indian pizza. Um, Mark, are you going to give us some directions what yeah, we're going to do? Let's go in uh, groups because it's kind of a tight space. So the tables with the priests want to go first, and then we'll go with these two, those two, and then those two. That would be great. All right. And then we're going to eat in here, though. Yeah, right? yeah. And then we'll come back and talk about some next steps. And uh, we'll, we'll be finished by 8 o'clock. So bless us, O oh Lord. And these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, why don't you take your table?